Hello, everybody, and welcome to another OpenShift Commons briefing. This time, again, we're going to be talking about TensorFlow. It's one of our um, more popular topics these days. Uh, Sabine Model from our OpenShift, Rad, OpenShift and RAD Analytics group um, will be giving the talk about containerizing TensorFlow. I uh, will toss into the chat a link if you're interested in this topic and want to hear more about it to sign up for the Machine Learning Special Interest Group. Uh, the way that we do this is you can ask questions in the chat. I will try and answer them, um, but we'll have live Q&A at the end too. So um, stay tuned and stay stay on afterwards and we'll do that. But what right now, we're going to let Sudin take it away and introduce himself in this topic. So there you go, Sudin. Uh, thank you, Diane. Uh, my name is Subin Modil, uh, and uh, welcome to today's uh, OpenShift Commons briefing. Uh, I'm going to talk about containerizing TensorFlow applications on OpenShift. Uh, I currently work in Red Hat, uh, and uh, I work in a group. Hey, Subin, you are hardly audible. Okay. Can Can you hear me now? Yes, better. Yeah. Okay. I'm adjusting the mic once more. Okay, testing my audio once more. Is it, am I audible? That's better. That's much better. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I work uh, in a group uh, in Red Hat called Rad Analytics. Uh, this is a community effort trying to empower people to do application development on OpenShift uh, with respect to the data-driven applications, uh, machine learning, etc. And uh, past few uh, uh, months I've been working on uh, TensorFlow and trying to do some TensorFlow applications on OpenShift. So uh, I would like to share some of my uh, learnings and notes in today's briefing. Uh, so this is basically uh, sharing my notes to the wider the community and not really a tutorial as such. Uh, I would like to talk more about how I used OpenShift for TensorFlow application development and some of the workflows which I uh, created for creating these applications. And you'll find uh, quite a lot of uh, notes from my side. So in some places it might be dense, in some places it might be light uh, with respect to technicalities. Uh, so, but unfortunately this uh, session cannot be something like a deep dive into TensorFlow or uh, you know any of this machine learning or OpenShift uh, platform. So, I try to align my notes uh, uh, with respect to building, creating, developing, and deploying uh, TensorFlow applications. So uh, this is the agenda for today. Uh, we're going to review some concepts like the OpenShift uh, source to image, OpenShift templates, and then uh, talk briefly about TensorFlow, trying to understand what training and inferences and where GPUs can help, and also talk about uh, TensorFlow models. So then we will talk about uh, building TensorFlow binaries from source uh, and why we need to do it and why it is complicated sometimes. And then talk about creating uh, Docker images for TensorFlow applications, uh, which can be used with source to image and which can be deployed uh, finally uh, with the uh, TensorFlow model. And then I talk about how you can develop using Jupyter Notebooks uh, on OpenShift. Uh, where you can use the underlying GPUs available. And uh, finally, once you have done the training on the data and you have the model uh, ready, you can deploy this TensorFlow model as a prediction endpoint, as a service endpoint in OpenShift. So just to review some of the concepts, maybe some folks are not familiar with uh, OpenShift and source to image. Source to image is a feature uh, in OpenShift. Uh, it's, it's a feature in OpenShift and also it's a tool. Uh, what it gives you is it lets you take, go from source code to a final application image, which can be uh, deployed on OpenShift. Uh, it is actually currently integrated into OpenShift and there's also a command line tool for it. Uh, it also combines a builder image uh, with a source code in GitHub to create this final application image. So this particular uh, chart uh, describes about how source to image works. The link below uh, uh, has an excellent uh, 
uh, explanation of the internals of source to image, uh, uh, which is also from uh, OpenShift Commons briefing. Uh, so here in this flowchart, you can see that um, a user writes the code using his choice IDE and then commits to GitHub. And from the GitHub repo, you can build using the builder image, you can create this application image from the source code and the builder image. The builder image is sometimes created by the same developer or it can come from you know some other place. For example, uh, Red Hat provides you know Python builder image and the user can just uh, develop the Python application code. And with this Python builder image as an example, we can create this application image which can run the Python application created by the user. This final application image can be pushed into the Docker registry and then can be used by OpenShift to deploy that application. You can have a single instance or multiple instance of this final application image. Just to break down uh, this particular flow, uh, what exactly happens uh, in a step-by-step -step case? The first thing what happens is that you need to provide the GitHub URL and the code is pulled from the GitHub and then a S2I builder image uh, is pulled and uh, both of them are pulled to the node in OpenShift and an assemble script. This assemble script as part of the S2I builder image that is run and after that a new image is created and finally this uh, application image is pushed to the internal OpenShift registry and finally when you want to do a deployment using the deployment config this particular uh, final application image is uh, uh, loaded and uh, the run script uh, is executed. So just, just to look at the logs, uh, if you have a build running and if you look at the logs, you can actually see uh, the step one, two and three, which is uh, you know pulling the uh, GitHub code. For example, here you can see there's a neural style GitHub uh, source code, which is getting pulled. And a certain uh, steps in the assemble script is executed here. And finally, when the assemble scripts are executed, uh, steps four and five, where you basically push the final application image back into the registry. And once the final application image is ready, you can actually deploy this uh, application image uh, as a running container. Now we are using this S2I, uh, probably exploiting uh, to uh, cater to the different needs of uh, developing applications with TensorFlow. Uh, a light introduction to TensorFlow next. Uh, TensorFlow, uh, as you know, is an open source library from Google um, used for machine learning, and it's uh, pretty popular uh, for deep learning applications as well. Uh, in TensorFlow, uh, the main constructs are in terms of uh, data flow diagrams, uh, graphs, sorry, data flow graphs, which define computations on the input data. These operations of the graph, uh, each node in the graph uh, denote an operation, and these operations uh, are, are kind of like a blueprint of the uh, execution on the data. And this blueprint is executed in a session. And there's a separation of blue, uh, creating the graph and executing the graph. The main reason is like, for example, if you use NumPy and other the tools, most of the calculation is done within the Python runtime. But in case of TensorFlow, the, we design this graph of computations and then we give this graph to a session. And this session executes uh, the operations in the graph outside the Python runtime. So looking at the code, uh, uh, we can, let, let us look at the code and try to understand what, what I mean by graphs and you know sessions and operations. So here uh, in cell number 38, um, uh, I, take, I take the default graph, which comes as you load TensorFlow, and I look at the operations available in the graph. So I can see that there's nothing there. And I then try to create a simple multiplication between two tensors. Um, tensors are like uh, multidimensional arrays of NumPy. And if I look at the operations again in the graph, I can see that there are two operations, A and B, and then there's a, a multi multiplication operation between A and B. And if I try to find out what is the value of C, uh, 
I noticed that there's actually no value in C, but C itself uh, points to a tensor. And to find out the value of C, I need to actually create a session object and then run uh, past that uh, uh, graph to the session object so that it can run that entire graph and calculate these values. So this is a difference uh, uh, compared to other frameworks with respect to, to the way the code is executed. Uh, in the latest code 1.4, uh, they have changed uh, this thing. They, they kept this session and graph same, but they have added a new feature called eager execution where you can actually uh, find the value of C instead of run it, running it within a session. For example, the line number eight will actually provide uh, the same output as cell number 10. Uh, and moving on, uh, other concept which you should know is what is training and inference. If you take a standard supervised learning pipeline, we start with a data, a labeled data, and we extract the features and we do the training, we train the model. Train the model mathematically uh, means trying to find the loss function and optimizing the loss function, uh, minimizing it uh, using gradient descent, and finally evaluating the model uh, to see if it uh, the error uh, rate is less. And then for finally, when we are satisfied, we we can have this model which uh, uh, can be used for predicting new values. So here you can see that after the data is trained, the model is then passed to the next uh, prediction layer where new data comes in and the, uh, the model which has been trained is used to predict the new data and extract the labels. So with respect to uh, TensorFlow, what is this model? And we need to understand what this model is and how it works. So if, when you train a new neural network uh, with TensorFlow, uh, you can actually save that particular graph of operations, uh, which is the neural network in TensorFlow, and you can save it with all, this, all its weights and parameters and its network architecture so that you can actually use it later for production or use it later for doing a retraining on existing models. So what does it mean? Let's take a simple example of this. Again, I import TensorFlow and I reset the default graph and I create few placeholders A, B, and I basically am trying to do this calculation, A plus B multiplied by C. I do this multiplication and as you know that uh, although the values are passed, the calculation of this final uh, A plus B multiplied by C is not executed unless you uh, call the session.run object. So here, what I do, I create these variables and placeholders, and then I try, I call this API method called saver, which is available in TensorFlow. And what it does is it saves uh, these uh, this particular graph into a TensorFlow model. Excuse me. <laughs> So TensorFlow model is consisting of four data, four uh, types of data. One is the metagraph, uh, one is a data file and the index files and checkpoint files. The metagraph is the actual TensorFlow graph with its operations and variables and et cetera. The data file contains uh, the actual values and of the variables in the graph. And the index files contain the different checkpoints which you do while iterating to minimize the loss function. So in this example, uh, uh, let me just show this online. Um, here it is. So here's an example where I, I do this operation in the graph A plus B multiplied by C. And once I uh, invoke the saver API and save that model from the session, I can see that in, in my file system, a couple of files called meta index data are created. The meta represents the graph, uh, data represents 
data represents uh, the values of the variables. So for example, here in this example, uh, I have stored a value called two in a variable called bias. So this data uh, file will contain this value two. So the model contains a graph containing this operation A plus B multiplied by C, and it also contains a saved value of a variable C called uh, with value two. Now, once these uh, model files are created, I can transfer this model files to any other system. And in, in assume that I am on a different system and I can take consume these model files and I can use this API available in TensorFlow called import metagraph, which consumes the meta files and recreates that graph of the operations A plus B multiplied by C. And it also, uh, from that, you can also extract if there are any saved values. For example, the bias value uh, was stored as two uh, in the previous code, and I can actually print that value out. You can see that I can print it from that graph, which I have extracted from the file. And then finally, once I have the graph, I can pass new values into, into that graph and compute the results. So for example, here I pass 13 and 17 into that operation and I get the new value 60. So with this simple example, what I'm trying to show you is that here is a training and I train a graph and I save the graph as model files. And then next step, I, uh, I put that model uh, into a different uh, place where the production uh, environment is. And I use that model files to load the model files to um, invoke that uh, graph with the new data. So just to repeat this diagram once more, uh, this uh, model I can get uh, after training and I pass this model to a different system where the new data is passed to this model. And uh, in TensorFlow, this model is the graph. Uh, so here I save the graph here. And in this green color box, I load that graph again and I pass in the new data to get the output. So this is one way you can use uh, um, TensorFlow graphs to save it as a, uh, these uh, model files. There's one more way which is called TensorFlow Serving. TensorFlow Serving is uh, one of the sub projects of TensorFlow where uh, TensorFlow Serving is a flexible high performance serving system for machine learning models. So with TensorFlow, you can save the same graph model into a format called saved model. So this saved model is something uh, from TensorFlow where the saved uh, graph model uh, using the saver API, there's a higher level abstraction applied to the saver class to cater to uh, this high performing uh, TensorFlow serving uh, server. I can show you some examples of how it might look, uh, for example, I have in this particular project uh, created a couple of uh, saved model uh, files. And these were very simple uh, uh, model because of MNIST, uh, it's not really complicated there. So here's how uh, those files from saved model look. They looked as, they, they end with .pb extension and there are some variables associated with uh, the uh, saved model, again, there's a data file which contains all the values and there's some index uh, which basically points to different checkpoints if you are uh, saving the models at checkpoints. So what what is uh, TensorFlow serving uh, and how can you use it? I mean, if you have played with TensorFlow, you, you would probably have used just pip install TensorFlow, but you would not have seen this TensorFlow model server. There's no way you can, uh, pip install TensorFlow model server. For example, you can see here that this is a TensorFlow model server which I created for a GPU and it's around 562 MB file. Uh, you need to actually build TensorFlow model server from source and it's a really a complicated process and I will come back to how to build it later on. Uh, but once you have this uh, model server, you can invoke it like this where you can give it the model name and then you can point this to the uh, path where this particular file is. Let me just show you that file again. So 
you just need to sh point a tensorflow model to the folder where variables and saved model is present and what a tensorflow model server will do is that it it will pick up the saved model format file and it will um, start executing it uh, sorry the font is pretty uh, small but if you can look at the slides later on you can uh, notice how it starts and there's a prediction endpoint created by tensorflow server uh, at port uh, 606 there's some other tools also uh, which is available from tensorflow uh, one is called uh, saved model cli so this uh, particular utility is pretty useful if you want to look into what a saved model file contains for example uh, this particular uh, command i have used to explore the saved model file which i just showed you on github so uh, if you look at what is printed out uh, you can figure out that there is a couple of two methods available in saved model uh, one is a method name called predict and another one is classify and the predict method uh, consumes a input which is float uh, with, with the shape of minus 1784 meaning that it's an array of 784 uh, elements and then it takes one more value called uh, uh, dropout uh, so these are the two inputs for this uh, method called predict and once these inputs are uh, given it actually gives you out uh, output called scores which is a float of 10 so this particular the saved model is used for MNIST MNIST is a data set for uh, identifying digits since there are 10 digits you can see that the output scores is for 10 classes which is from 0 to 9 so this is one of the other useful tool uh, which you can use from tensorflow uh, to actually look into the saved model and to figure out uh, how i can consume a saved model assume that you get the saved model from online some source and you want to write an api or something to consume the saved model to do some prediction you need to use these tools to actually figure out what is the spec of this saved model what is the input what's the output uh, what's the shape of the input and uh, what are the methods available what can i do with this particular saved model uh, uh, more information about uh, this is available here uh, you can actually go to the link Uh, about saved model you can find everything about saved model here there are a lot of options about saved model this is something which i've been frequently using right now whenever i need to debug uh, stuff whenever i need to write clients uh, with saved model so moving forward uh, what did we cover so far we try to cover what is a tensorflow graph what's a tensorflow model what, what do you mean by it what's the safe model and what's the tensorflow serving project what is the tensorflow serving uh, model file and what is the source to image uh, in openshift so we're now going to use all this to create tensorflow applications and deploying them before we jump into writing tensorflow applications i need to cover the next part of my agenda uh, so we did the review and the next part is about building and creating and setting up stuff uh, so that we can actually begin our work so one thing i notice is that uh, if you use pip install tensorflow it the the binary which you get is something which is not optimized so if you just have cpus uh, with you and no gpu with it and if you're using the uh, default tensorflow binary sometimes you might not get the performance uh, you can get if you actually build it from the source there is a reason behind it when you build tensorflow from the source you can actually apply a lot of compile time optimizations uh, to the tensorflow code so that you can you can get better performance from the tensorflow binary which you created from your own source so if you have tried building tensorflow from the source it is really complicated they have uh, they have used a tool called bazel which is really complicated to you it's not complicated to set up but it takes a really long time to run and when things go when the build fails 
I mean, you have no idea how do you fix that, fix it. And to get the environment itself correct for the Bazel command to execute, it's kind of difficult. So I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how exactly to build uh, TensorFlow. So after a lot of efforts, I found that having a S2I build image, which I can use to build uh, TensorFlow binaries, it really eases uh, my trouble of building TensorFlow from source. I can give you one example where a couple of days back, uh, uh, I had to move from 1.3 TensorFlow to 1.4 and I couldn't find a 1.4 binary and I had to build it myself. And when I used this particular uh, S2I, I was able to do it. Uh, going to this particular GitHub, I want to talk about how exactly it works uh, and how exactly you can use it. Uh, if you have not used uh, S2I before, it doesn't matter. If you want to use this particular uh, uh, project, the TensorFlow Build S2I, all you need to do is you need to go to this template. Every project which I'm going to show today has a template. And you need to take this template and you need to go to your OpenShift and uh, create a project, go to a project and add this particular uh, template, which I'm going to open right now. So I'm back to the OpenShift, create. So I'm not going to create it, but I just want to talk about uh, what are the different things this template provides. So this particular template, what it does is it downloads the TensorFlow uh, source code from GitHub, from the master repo, and it gives you a whole bunch of options, which is consumed by Bazel and uh, TensorFlow to build uh, TensorFlow binaries. So there are things like uh, if you are building it for GPU, uh, it's different. If you're building it for CPU, it's different. You need to define the CUDA versions, uh, the CUDNN versions, uh, a lot of uh, information like which uh, path to use, um, whether you need to use a CLang or GCP or you know HDFS, stuff like that. So this particular TensorFlow uh, kind of uh, gives you all these parameters where you can just fill in those parameters and above all, uh, there's this field called uh, uh, custom build. So this custom build, you can actually pass in the build command to build uh, TensorFlow. For example, uh, you can see here in the dropdown, there are two commands which I use. The first command uh, does a Bazel build for uh, creating uh, uh, TensorFlow uh, pip uh, wheel file. And the second one is actually uh, the one which creates a TensorFlow pip wheel file for the CUDA. So I pass this and what happens is that a TensorFlow build, for example, you can see here, uh, there's a build which happens um, once the uh, build completes a pod, a container, the pod starts. And in the container pod, that particular Bazel build command uh, is executed. If if I can see the logs, let me see. Okay, so you can see all this is basically the complicated build process which TensorFlow follows. Um, and finally, what what I give you is that if this build is successful, you can just click on this particular link. And when you go to the link, you can actually uh, see the binaries available for the, uh, this particular build. Uh, coming back uh, to the page to find out what is that I have built. Uh, for example, this particular project, I have named it as model server. So I'm trying to build a TensorFlow model server and you can see that I have built it successfully here. So, this is a binary which is available for uh, consumption. Uh, and this particular binary is for GPU. So I would have uh, enabled uh, a lot of parameters which are related to CUDA. For example, CUDA version is set, the CUDA compute capabilities, and the most important uh, verb called uh, TF need CUDA, which is set to one. So this thing, uh, this particular S2I build for the TensorFlow binaries builds the TensorFlow model server. 
And if I look at the other projects which I have, I have one more for the, um, uh, this particular build, successfully built the wheel file for TensorFlow 1.4 uh, for GPU. Let me just close that and close this. And let me go back and see if I have created um, any other uh, builds. So I have also created a TensorFlow, uh, a TensorFlow wheel file for CPU. And okay, so I have I have been able to successfully build that. Uh, so you can just play with the uh, custom fields, uh, uh, Param, in in the template, and pass in the appropriate uh, Bazel build command to create whichever binary you want. So now again moving back to that particular repository. Uh, the readme contains uh, the all the different options and values and how you can use this and some examples of how you can create this binary for CPU and GPU, stuff like that. And uh, the reason why we need to do this is that if you pass in these optimizations and if your platform actually support these optimizations, TensorFlow is actually faster than the default uh, uh, pip install TensorFlow uh, binary, which is available. So coming back to the slides. So this is uh, the reason why I built Tensor, TensorFlow from the source, and this is the project which I use to build TensorFlow. Uh, the next part uh, is to create Docker files. Uh, we need to have uh, CUDA and uh, the CUDA neural network library in the pod so that the TensorFlow applications can work. Now, the thing about uh, CUDA is that this thing is uh, uh, bound by the NVIDIA license. So you need to be very careful with this. Uh, uh, you cannot simply download and distribute this and you need to uh, ensure that you are extend from the right Docker Hub uh, uh, image. So for example, uh, this is one uh, particular uh, image which I uh, created for neural style, which is an application which I'm going to talk later on. And here I I am extending this from the NVIDIA CUDA, CUDA 9 and the like, CUDA NN7 runtime, which is actually allowed by NVIDIA. So you can actually down, um, extend from the runtime a Docker image, and then you can create your application uh, Docker file from that. So I will explore the Docker file some more um, for this application. So the neural style is one application which I'll explain later. And for this particular application, the Docker file I extend from NVIDIA CUDA. And then I had to set few uh, environment variables uh, to uh, make uh, TensorFlow figure out where the CUDA home is, where the CUDA path is, etc. And after that, um, uh, I need to install a few other binaries uh, of CUDA, which is not available in the default um, image from NVIDIA. So I uh, download the CUDA RPMs from the uh, NVIDIA uh, repository. And once this particular uh, binaries, are, binaries are installed, I can go ahead and I can uh, install the TensorFlow binary which I built myself and uh, the TensorFlow will then continue to work. Else uh, it will complain saying that uh, CUDA libs are not found and you cannot basically use uh, TensorFlow on GPU in a pod. So coming back again uh, to this, uh, this particular setup of extending from this particular CUDA image might change with the uh, something called NVIDIA container runtime. But as of now, if we need to use, uh, you know, the CUDA images in the community, uh, this is the way to go. So just to um, uh, repeat that, the runtime images are this, and you can okay to extend it. And if you choose to publish on Docker Hub those images, you need to carry this uh, NVIDIA license uh, and you should not distribute this for any uh, other purpose other than probably community efforts. Uh, 
so the next thing which I want to talk about is uh, setting up OpenShift with the uh, GPU. Uh, before uh, you set up OpenShift to identify GPUs, you need to actually figure out what is the uh, NVIDIA driver and what is the GPU available on your system. So you need to go to um, your system and figure out what is the GPU available and then go to NVIDIA website, download the NVIDIA driver. Uh, for example, in my cluster, I was using Tesla M class M60 for Linux 64 bit and I choose to use uh, CUDA 9. So I had to download this particular driver to um, get uh, OpenShift to work with GPU. Now, the steps for setting up OpenShift with GPU, there are quite a lot of steps. Uh, I have documented these steps here. And there's also a blog from OpenShift guys uh, here on the OpenShift blog. Uh, you can refer both of them and uh, figure out um, how to set up uh, the OpenShift uh, node so that OpenShift can identify the GPUs. Uh, I don't want to go into them because, you know, uh, they're nothing but just uh, just files of all the commands uh, which I executed. So once you have uh, created uh, your own TensorFlow uh, binary and once you have created a Docker file uh, extending from CUDA and then you have created uh, set up OpenShift with GPU, the next thing you need to do is you need to create these templates uh, so that uh, you can actually uh, invoke um, sorry, you, you can actually deploy these templates so that the application pods can uh, consume the GPU and you can actually do some training in that pod. Uh, so the template changes with respect to OpenShift and GPU, uh, the, major, the major changes are here. One is uh, you need to add uh, uh, this node affinity uh, parameters here where you need to feed in a key called alpha kubernetes io nvidia gpu name and you need to figure out what is the gpu name for the gpu on your system and feed in here so this is something which you pass to the deployment config so this is the first uh, uh, param and the next one is that you need to actually set the resource limits on how many gpus uh, your deployment config will consume uh, since my systems only had a single gpu i will be only using a gpu limit of one and these uh, uh, these params are actually mentioned below. I will actually go and deploy this particular template on a GPU uh, cluster. And I will talk about how having these templates actually help you uh, deploy them. Let me just go to that soon. Okay, so I'm just importing that particular template. So once the template is created, and if you want to deploy that uh, application from the template, you can see that you can define the GPU image which you need to uh, give. Here, these GPU images are mined, and uh, you can replace them with the GPU images you have. And you need to provide the GPU uh, name. For example, mine is Tesla M60, but yours might be you know, some other class. And how many GPUs do you want this particular application to have? To, so having such templates for each of your application is actually good because people can actually consume these templates and uh, you know deploy them on OpenShift to see if your Docker images or, or your applications can be actually executed on the OpenShift cluster. And you no, know, basically repeatable research. You know, if you have some project and you want to test it, uh, this thing is having a template which works. You know, it saves you a lot of time. So most of my projects have a template in them. So all the projects which I share today as part of the slides will be having a template.json file, a template.gpu.json file, the gpu.json file is something which you can deploy on a cluster which has GPU and template.json is for the cluster which doesn't have GPU. So coming back to the slides again. Um, so we have reviewed and uh, then what we have done is we have talked about Docker file, setting up OpenShift with GPU, the templates. 
and uh, now we jump into developing uh, applications so what i notice is that you know everyone is using uh, jupyter notebooks and having a jupyter notebook for tensorflow is something which uh, kind of helps me uh, develop sooner iterate faster so this is one particular project which i created under rad analytics io which is a tensorflow jupyter notebook image so this thing uh, is uh, uh, having a jupyter notebook uh, in centos 7 image one of the good things about this particular image is that if you deploy this on cluster on openshift cluster for example uh, this particular notebook is deployed on openshift cluster and i use this uh, for my development you can go ahead and uh, install any of the libraries you want from the within the pod for example here i have a, a tensorflow binary which was pre installed in the pod with version 1.2.1 and i needed to upgrade it to 1.3.0 so i did a conda install uh, tensorflow it went ahead and installed the binary and and finally i found that i had upgraded to 1.3.0 i could if i want go and uh, download the binary which i built myself i can do a wget here and then do a pip install of that wheel file and i can upgrade from 1.3 to 1.4 and uh, this particular project uh, tensorflow based notebook this is what i use uh, for you know developing applications and uh, uh, iterating over them and another uh, thing about this uh, um, notebook is that i have a uh, put tensorflow model server available in in this particular uh, notebook so so that if anybody wants to uh, you know play with the tensorflow model server or the saved model format they can go ahead and you know uh, play with this binary from the tensorflow notebook and uh, let, let me just uh, talk about uh, how i have been developing applications on tensorflow uh, i usually you know write all my code here and you know uh, once i try to save the model uh, into the model files and then what i do is i always check if i can consume the same model files and uh, uh, invoke these uh, uh, new, invoke the new data on the uh, model file using a, a rest api for example i have created a sample flask app here where i create a prediction endpoint and the prediction endpoint all it does is it consumes a request in into the input field and here i consume the uh, a model file and i i execute that particular graph by inputting uh, the new input which has come as part of the rest request so this is a way you can actually test uh, your model and practice uh, application development so that you can do the training and once you are happy with the training you can save the model and uh, then publish the model onto some you know dropbox or some place a google file store and from there somebody else can consume that particular model and they can you know uh, develop applications or flask application or something else and create a prediction endpoint uh, which can be consumed by some other web application for example you know if you look at google uh, what they have done is that they have published a lot of models and they have also uh, published a website where you can actually go and uh, uh, input um new data and uh, uh, it will do prediction on the new data so th this is a kind of a workflow which i i have been following uh, and uh, having a tensorflow notebook uh, which which has all these capabilities of installing new uh, uh, libraries with pip install conda install you know doing a wget doing a git clone and trying to play with all these uh, code play with others code and do a testing do a, create a flask app uh, test the flask app uh, kind of helps me you know create uh, tensorflow applications sooner so this this is what i've been using majorly for development and i have uh, 
a demo which where I can show you a TensorFlow uh, notebook which is used for both uh, CPU and GPU. So here's one uh, cluster with a, a TensorFlow notebook. And if you use that template file, which I've shown you in the GitHub, uh, and if you deploy it on OpenShift, you can actually find a pod with a route. And if you click on the route, you can actually, oh, you can go to the Jupyter Notebook with, uh, you know, you can create files and finally you can, you know, save it and push it back to your GitHub. Uh, and there's one more um, cluster I have. This is a cluster which I have for the GPU. And in this demo namespace, I have uh, I have a Jupyter Notebook here. I have, as you notice, the pods is, pod is set to zero mainly because I have scaled it down. Uh, there's a single GPU here, and if I create multiple applications, uh, all the applications will be fighting for that single GPU. So I'm, I basically disable all the pods, and for the demo purpose, I just uh, scale up single pod at a time per application. So coming back to the slides again, uh, I coming back to the slides again. Let me just do a demo of this. Let me just scale that up and hopefully it has come up. Yeah, great. Okay, I'm going to create a new um, um, code here so that I can show you um, that it works. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at um, the TensorFlow here. Uh, what is the version? And I'm trying to upgrade it. Import TensorFlow as TF. So there's no TensorFlow there. That's fine. So I'm going to do a slight cleanup activity of removing if any existing TensorFlow NumPy is there. And after that, I am. What I'm going to do is, I'm going to. Um, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to get a TensorFlow binary which I created myself using the TensorFlow build source to image project. And uh, this thing is for GPU. And I'm going to get that, and I'm going to install that uh, in this particular pod. So it's going to take some time, uh, and I will just uh, copy paste the piece of code which I, I plan to execute on GPU. I'll just wait for it to complete. So it looks like I have, I have completed it. Yes, I have completed it. So you can see that that particular cell is executed. So now what I will do is I'm going to show you NVIDIA um, so my, okay. I'm just going to log into um, that particular machine which has GPU to show, show the GPU activity. Okay, so right now you can see that uh, I have a single GPU in my node called Tesla M60 here. And uh, what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna execute some code from from the Python notebook to, see, to show you that uh, GPU is ac actually being used. So I'm coming back to my notebook and I'm just going to execute uh, this particular multiplication operation where I have two tensors. I'm just multiplying both of them using the session object. And uh, let's just execute what happened. Okay, I need to restart the kernel sometimes. Restart. Let me test if TensorFlow exists. Yes, TensorFlow exists. And I want to also show you what is the version of the TensorFlow which I have installed. 
okay it's 1.4 and um, let me just execute this and come back to uh, the nvidia smi you can see that now a process name has shown up here which is the conda bin python so this is basically this particular code uh, tensorflow is executing uh, this particular operations using uh, the gpu which is accessible from the pod uh, running jupyter notebook and you can see that proof uh, here where you can see that the pid and the process uh, from the jupyter notebook pod okay so exiting this coming back to the slides so we understand how we can deploy it and what are the bits which we need while doing the development we go to the next thing called deployment and i'm going to show here some fun apps which i have created uh, one particular application is the mnist app mnist uh, many people consider it as the hello world uh, application and if you click on this link i have actually uh, we have a blog on rad analytics talking about this particular application and how we have developed this application we have used source to image uh, what this particular application contains is it contains two services uh, prediction service 1 and prediction service 2 and each of them is having a tensorflow model and each model is different one is using a Uh, logistic regression and one is using uh, convolutional uh, neural networks and there is a web ui which is connected to both these prediction services and from the web ui we are actually sending data a uh, new data to the model and the model does the prediction and replies back with a response uh, i would like to give the credits of course to uh, mr the yoshihiro sugi who developed the ui but the back end was developed by me uh so you can go through this uh, installation steps and figure out how to you know create this uh, application again i always give a template in every project i have so you create a project and then you deploy the mnist web application template and then i have this uh, tensorflow serving endpoints template and once these two templates are created i create two prediction endpoints now these two prediction endpoints what they do is they consume a tensorflow model and then they serve it uh so here is one particular uh, endpoint where i consume uh, a tensorflow model which has been published on github and here is another tensorflow serving uh, endpoint where i consume another uh, a tensorflow model and i uh, create that uh, prediction endpoint once i create these two prediction endpoints called tf reg and uh, tf cnn i pass in these service endpoint names to the web application so for example you can see here that i create a new mnist web application with prediction service 1 as the first service endpoint which is here and the second prediction service endpoint called tf hyphen cnn which is the second uh, uh prediction in point i created here so just to show how it works and what it is uh, uh i have created this particular application on my openshift cluster it will create uh, three pods so you can see here on the bottom are uh, two uh, prediction endpoints which consume uh, two different uh, tensorflow models and here is my web application and this web application what it does is it does digit identification using mnist data so i can give it a uh, uh, input and this input is sent to both the prediction endpoints uh, which contain uh, different models so you can do you can do a kind of ab testing with this for example i whatever input i gave it predicts uh, the correct value as uh, the number let me give a different value here for Uh, okay again it both of them seem to be predicting similar value let me give a different value slightly angled so you can see here the, this i wrote the digit 5 in a slight angle and you can see that the model 1 kind of failed to predict what the value was but the model 2 is pretty good it was able to predict uh, the value i'll give you one more example and then i'll go to the next application uh so here you can see that uh, i wanted to write a 7 but i just stopped in between 
and you can see that model two looks thinks that this is a two. I think this can pass as a two, uh, but definitely not as a three, which model one thinks. So moving on to the next application, um, on a high level, the architecture looks like this. Uh, the way I developed this is from Jupyter uh, notebooks and um, you know writing the code in the Jupyter notebooks and then finally putting into a Python script. And uh, again, a high level architecture of how I did it, notebook on OpenShift with GPUs. I did the training, I had the MNIST data, created the model, published to GitHub. So all the models which I created got published to GitHub. So this thing uh, is similar to the pipeline, which I discussed earlier. And I use a S2I build driven uh, prediction endpoint deployment where the model from uh, GitHub, which I created and published in GitHub, I pass that model to my S2I build config. And the build config consumes the model from GitHub. It consumes the, the TensorFlow binary from some other source and it uses a TensorFlow serving um, builder image and it creates an application image which once it uh, runs, it basically starts a prediction service endpoint. But just to uh, tell what that prediction endpoint looks like, so for example, this thing is a neural network uh, prediction endpoint, this is a pod. Uh, this prediction endpoint is hosted at port uh, 6006. If I just look at the logs, um, you can see that this thing is a TensorFlow, TensorFlow model server. You can see TensorFlow model server and it's running the model server at uh, port 606. And this, this particular web application is actually sending the input data to 606 and it is getting back the um, uh, labeled output. Uh, moving quickly, to the next uh, application, which is uh, neural style. Uh, I have another five slides. Uh, so neural style is a process of using uh, convolutional neural networks to migrate uh, semantic content of one image to different styles. Uh, there are a couple of applications in the real world. Uh, some of you might be using Prisma app on, uh, on your iPhones. Uh, this thing is another the, uh, website uh, which basically uh, does the same thing. So neural style transfer is where you have this particular input, which is on the left-hand side, the diagram of, let me take a better example. Um, yeah, okay, so you you take an input example, for example, here it's a Mona Lisa, and the right-hand side is a content of, it, it could be a painting of a well-known uh, painter, and you transfer the uh, style from right hand side to left hand side and to get this particular output where you know it still looks like Mona Lisa I think but you know it has this uh, funky style of uh, this particular artist and again uh, another example where uh, you know an image of a woman transferred into this particular you know uh, it looks like a wood carving or something so this semantic content style has been transferred to that particular image uh, so this application, uh, what I have uh, is some, uh, coming back to the slides. So the way I uh, have uh, developed this application is slightly different from the MNIST app. Uh, here, if I go back to the MNIST app, the GitHub repository contained the model, but in this case, the GitHub repository contained the source code where uh, uh, the source code uh, for the actually creating the model for the neural style transfer. So I again use S2I build, I consume that uh, TensorFlow code from the source and I create this application image and once the application remain image starts, it does the training at the start time. Since we have GPUs uh, for this particular application, the training time is actually very less. And within, uh, uh, so when I compared the training times between CPU and GPU, uh, there was almost 98% reduction time in our training. Uh, the training on CPUs for neural style transfer took me like one hour, sometimes one and a half for a thousand iterations. And for the same number of iterations on a GPU, it took me like two minutes 
sometimes uh, three. Uh, I just want to do a quick demo of it. And um, this thing, uh, these links are the source code of this particular application. Uh, coming back to the web application. So, so I'm coming back to the GPU uh, cluster I have. I'm going to scale down my uh, Jupyter Notebook app so that I can deploy one more application which can consume uh, GPU. So I have a neural style application uh, deployed, but there's no pod running. What all I need to do is scale up this particular pod and it will trigger uh, a TensorFlow training. And once the training is done, it will actually consume a test image and convert the test image to a, a, a different image after the style transfer is done. Uh, let me show you a worked example of that. Okay, so if you go to go to this particular um, uh, project again, you will find a template. You can just deploy the template, and it's going to create this particular pod. And uh, once the build is done, the pod pod will start. And when the pod starts, the training uh, uh, will co continue. And once the training completes. Uh, a model file, a TensorFlow model file is created, and uh, uh, I kind of host it to show what exactly happened. So, for example, what I'm trying to do with this particular code is that I I give it this input content, and I try to convert that uh, input image to this famous painting style, and this is what I get output. So this is, you can see the content style has been transferred to this image. And I put some metrics here. For example, you can see the time here is, uh, uh, it's actually three, five, four, three seconds, which is about about one hour. But if, if I do the same thing on uh, GPU, it's going to take like three minutes. Uh, it has not yet completed, but once it completes, I'll come back to it. Uh, moving on, my last application, which is the Inception app. Uh, Inception app is based on a data set which is available um, in Google. Uh, the data set is called ImageNet. It's a large scale image data set uh, somewhere introduced in 2010. Uh, you can go to this particular the link and it will show you how it is deployed. Uh, I have an example of that particular application just to show you what it does. So if you follow that particular um, uh, template, it's going to create again two pods. Uh, one is the web UI and the other is the TensorFlow server. Uh, the TensorFlow server is serving the inception uh, model and the inception app is a web UI which looks like this where you can just give it uh, input. For example, I pass it a dog, dog image, and it gives you the top five results of that particular image. So the image which I gave was, um, just to show you what it was, So this is the image which I passed, and it identifies that image as a Yorkshire uh, Terrier dog, and that's what it thinks. And it also gives you the four other uh, names, uh, labels for this particular input image. One thing I want to show with respect to Inception app is that there are about 1,000 labels for this particular model. But if you want to create a new model, for example, if I give this input image of uh, the Prime Minister of Japan, uh, Mr. Shinzo Abe, uh, and I try to uh, ask this particular app to predict what it is, it's going to tell you that it's a groom, bright groom, and it's not a Shinzo Abe or the, uh, or some other you know, well-known personalities because this particular label of Shinzo Abe is not among the thousand labels this particular model can predict. Uh, so how can you add new labels like this? Uh, jumping to the next slide, 
you can consume the published models and you can train new input data. For example, the Shinzo Abe uh, is a label uh, and you, you can consume the existing models and train on these existing models to create new models which can train new labels. So I, uh, so transfer learning is one way we do that. Uh, uh, GitHub, if you, if you actually go on GitHub uh, to this link, you can see some of the pre-trained uh, models published by uh, Google. There are also some pre-trained models published by Mozilla, uh, Twitter and other companies where they have their large scale clusters and a lot of data and uh, deep neural networks where they have tried to solve different problems of image recognition, speech recognition, NLP and stuff like that. And they have published these models to the outside world. And we can basically consume these models and do apply transfer learning on these models for new data set. So this is my last memo about uh, transfer learning and uh, we build on Inception app and after that I'm done. So coming back to the neural style, just to show you that my training has completed. So this thing is a neural style training which happened on GPU and same thing, uh, I try to create this output uh, image. And if I look at the time, the time here is 2.32. If I divide by 60, that's like 3.8 minutes. So you can see that uh, training is faster on GPU. I'm going to uh, downgrade that, scale down that image so that I can show you the transfer learning uh, demo. And I want to scale this up. I'm just going to wait for this image to start. And as it starts, I'm going to just talk about uh, tensor transfer learning. So with TensorFlow, you can actually do transfer learning where you start with a model which has been published by Google, Twitter, or some other companies, which has already been trained on a, a set of problems and with has a predefined class of labels. And you can retrain on a different problem to get a new set of labels to which the model can actually do the prediction. So deep learning from scratch can take days. These companies do these learnings uh, and create these models by you know deploying on large scale clusters and taking like uh, 10 days or 15 days to develop these models. But once these models are available, uh, we uh, people can actually use these models to create our own models for uh, you know predicting new uh, data set. So how exactly it should work is where we need to write our source code to do transfer learning on GitHub and we need to use S2I build to consume this uh, TensorFlow code. And we need to also consume this uh, externally published model into the build and then finally create the application container. And in the application container, when we the application container starts, we can provide new data for the uh, source uh, for the TensorFlow application to train. And once the training is done and once the model files are saved, we can start the prediction service. I do not have this end-to-end uh, -end working for transfer learning, but just to show you the concept and how uh, we can um, uh, see it working and how we can actually try it out. Again, I'm going to open my Jupyter notebook, uh, notebook uh, pod on a GPU. And I'm going to quickly uh, 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 install the latest TensorFlow for GPU so that um, I can complete this demo. So what I'm doing right now is I'm trying to do some cleanup and I'm trying to upgrade uh, the TensorFlow in my notebook from the default 1.2 to 1.4 for GPU. Uh, so it's quickly downloading and installing. And once it comes, it is still, you know, okay, it's completed now. And what I will do is next, I'm going to download 
uh, a new set of files, which I will show you what they are. Uh, no module name, TensorFlow, published, restart. So what I've done exactly here is that I have uh, downloaded new data and this new data, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to take one of the existing uh, models out from uh, Google and I'm going to train a new set of data and so that I can predict these personalities like Merkel, Modi, Shinzo Abe and Theresa May. And I have downloaded uh, these people, uh, personalities uh, photos a uh, lot of photos, around 40 to 50 photos. Uh, in some cases, 100 to 200 photos. And then what I will do is I'm going to execute some code here to actually show how I retrain on an existing model and I save the model and then I predict the new uh, labels on these particular models. So in this demo, I'm using uh, uh, a model called uh, mobile net this is from google and uh, once the model is um, um, once the model is uh, running i'm actually doing a retrain steps here where the existing model i use and i retrain the new data on this particular model and if you notice that uh, the GPU consumption for this retraining in transfer learning is very less. As a matter of fact, if you're using transfer learning, you don't need to use GPU at all. You can see here that if you, when I did neural style transfer, the volatile GPU was around 100 percentage. But uh, for this particular uh, application, it's very less. So I will wait for the retraining to complete. It's going to complete, it's going to take some time. Let me just go back to the slides and cover some material for the TensorFlow transfer learning. So what you can see right now is that um, I'm just creating, using a TensorFlow notebook to do an application development, but I have not done what you see here, this S2I build driven deployment. Uh, but once I do the application development, I can basically get this thing uh, set up and create a template and probably publish it for the community to explore. Uh, this is going to take some more time. And if I just look at the GP utilization, it's not much, just one or two percentage. Uh, going to wait for some more time to complete this. As you can see, the training can take a lot of time. If you have a GPU, you can actually save some time training. Uh, in the meantime, if anybody has any questions, uh, definitely I can take that. I had one quick question for you, um, and we're really running towards the end of the time limit here, but um, where are you actually running um, your OpenShift? Is, it looks like to me it's like either on bare metal or on a, AWS, but where are you getting these GPUs from? Okay, so I should explain that this thing is OpenShift on uh, AWS. So this is an EC2 instance and I'm using a GPU provided by Amazon. I think you can also do this on bare metal as well. Yes. But uh, the reason I wanted to do this is that uh, GPUs are really expensive. Mm -hmm. For example, one GPU is probably 4000 to $8,000 yep. for, for the server. And if I use a GPU for one whole month, I might be spending like probably, you know, it's, I don't know, 
maybe 300 400 dollars maybe less much less actually so there's a cost effectiveness of using gpus in the cloud and i i think that that's an approach which everyone will do for the training uh, machine learning applications yeah. yeah that's that's correct we're um we're having a machine learning panel at the um OpenShift Commons gathering next week. And uh, I think that's really the approach that we're, we're looking at. It's like using some of um, Google's tools to do the models, create the models, and then run them, or create the models locally on in your Jupyter Notebook. And this whole approach with the TensorFlow um, server is, is really kind of, I think, the way people will be going. Yes. So uh, for my transfer learning, I have completed my retraining uh, process. And I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to download a new uh, image of uh, Mr. Shinsobe. And just to see what, what that particular image is, I'm going back. So this thing is a new image which I downloaded it's a pretty huge image. <laughs> um, just to prove that that guy is Shinzo Abe. Yeah, that guy, <laughs> sorry, too big. Um, so uh, as you can see that I have done the training and I have an accuracy of 86.5 percentage. And I have um, trained new set of uh, labels for you know, and just to show you what what those labels are see after retraining what i've done as part of retraining is that i wanted to retrain the in the model which was published by google and create a new prediction endpoint which can cater to these five labels so assuming that i have a web application where i publish a photo of mr shinzo abe or merkel or modi these are the prime ministers of different countries i wanted my model to predict accurately whether the image falls into any of these five labels so after the retraining, I noticed that I have 86.5% accuracy and I have downloaded a sample image of Mr. Shinzo Abe. And I'm going to ask my model whether it can predict Mr. Shinzo Abe accurately. And the code is this. And it's going to use the underlying Tesla GPU for this particular prediction, which is not re really required. But you can see that uh, after evaluation, it gives you the results here. And it says with a good accuracy that that particular image is for Shinzo Abe. So this particular example, what I'm trying to show you is that I have consumed a model published by Google. I have done a retraining for new set of labels, which I have highlighted here, and I have tested uh, uh, a sample image with the model to give a, get a correct prediction. And I've done this all on OpenShift. And, you know, uh, to be frank, uh, having OpenShift and doing this application development on OpenShift has been actually easier for me to create more applications and create more templates. Um, so that, in that way, I wanted to say that, you know, if as a community, if uh, if you can give, uh, look at my examples and bring out more examples and probably somebody uh, coming forward to showcase their templates and their applications which they have developed using uh, some of the methods which I have highlighted uh, in today's slides, that would be great. Um, hoping for more feedback from the community um, on this efforts. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, Subin, thank you very much. Um, I, I have a, a, a thought. Um, I know on the RAD Analytics page, um, you have a, a number of these templates and blog, you've blogged about this stuff, but you also mentioned like Google has a repository of all of their models um, for people to use. Do we have plans for anything like that um, for the stuff like you've created a number of things here um, that are in your personal repo, but to, to make some sort of um, repository of models that use the S2I approach 
um, available to people or um, do I need to do something as a community manager for OpenShift is kind of what I'm getting at here. Well, some of the uh, projects which I showcased today are from my personal repository, mainly because uh, uh, some of them are related to GPUs and NVIDIA and I had to wait for others to give me a feedback, a green light to actually publish them. And I actually got it yesterday. And yeah. um, so I can actually uh, transfer all those code to the ad analytics. So yeah. you will find most of what I have shown today available as proper write-ups, as proper blog entries with detailed explanations on how it happens and how it can be done on blog on the Rad Analytics blog soon, probably under two weeks. Awesome. So um, that's that's a great uh, segue into um, saying thank you to you for this, uh, this uh, wonderful tutorial and explanation. It went a little bit longer than um, we usually do, so um, if you can share the slides with me, so then afterwards I'll try and put some markers in the recording um, when we load this onto YouTube so people can find the different points of entry for the different pieces of the, of the talk. Um, and we may even split this into two uh, pieces. But um, there's a lot going on um, in the machine learning workflow space on OpenShift. Again, if you're interested in this, if you go to commons.openshift.org, you'll find um, a sign up for the machine learning special interest group. And next week we'll be in Austin, Texas, talking with folks from um, across the board at um, the OpenShift ecosystem from Google, from Anaconda, um, from the Python community and elsewhere um, about what they're thinking are the next um, phases for machine learning um, and tooling. Um, that we need to get ready on OpenShift. So again, Modil, thank you very much for today. Um, and we look forward to many more of these talks. Thank you.